It should be known by all seekers of truth that Atmigyan, that special knowledge of reality, is the greatest purifier in all the worlds. Those wise ones realize this in due time. Om peace, peace, peace. Om tad viddi pranipatena pariparsjena sevaya. Upadekshanti te jnana jnaninas tatva darshinaha. Om shantihi, shantihi, shantihi. Those sincere seekers of knowledge approach the teacher with reverence via prostration and rendering selfless service. Then those wise knowers of truth initiate them into the highest wisdom. Om peace, peace, peace. And then there shines Brahman. May that Brahman protect us, may that Brahman sustain us, and may that Brahman illumine our thinking process. May we not find fault with each other, with the world, or with the teachings. And may what we study be a source of inspiration to us eternally. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us and may peace be unto all. Om Hariyom, Hariyom, Hariyom Tatsat. And with these two slokas from the Bhagavad Gita by Sri Krishna on the highest wisdom, which we know as Atma Gyan or Vivaka Gyan, that knowledge which transcends a paravidya, the lower knowledge and sciences and arts and so forth, and is specific for introducing the sincere seeker into the atmospheres of higher truth, the uh, province of the enlightened, as Gaudapada, the great Advaita Vedantist, has told us. And we were looking into some of those over the last three or four weeks in that class series we just completed called The Walker of the Skies, which is a very beautiful metaphorical saying, which Lord Vashishta used in Yoga Vashishta, that profound scripture. Um, we have our own translation of that in SRV, which an edition of that, which you can look into, which is a slimmed down version of the slimmed down version, which is a volum voluminous work. The Lagu Yoga Vasishta, it's called. And in that, we find these great teachings of Lord Vashishta as he teaches the young Ram Chandra, must be a teenager about that time, still not fully aware of his avatarhood as he is going to be followed by millions and millions of souls for thousands and thousands of years, this great soul. And I bring it up specifically today. Why? Because <laughs> tomorrow is, uh, is uh, if you're in India, tomorrow is Ram Navami. So on Wednesday here in the West, we'll be looking into that special birthday, Puja Tirtha time of Sri Ramchandra with his famous consort Sita uh, uh, as both Sri Ramakrishna and Va Swami Vivekananda who had visions of her in their meditations told us most the purest of all women in the world and his great and even more famous devotee Hanuman, the monkey god with all his powers and his antics and uh, how how he has delighted people, not just in India, but also throughout the world, has become very well known as, as a Mahavir was his name that Ramchandra gave him, a great hero, as he helped 
rescue Sita from Ravana, the great demon of the time. And then his half-brothers, Satrugya, particularly Lakshmana, who went into, uh, into uh, the woods with him when he was sent away, <clears throat> and where he met Vishvamitra and other great rishis. Uh, and prior to that, he had gone on pilgrimage and come back and had great counsel of Lord Vashishta, who was uh, one of the mind-born sons of Swayambhavamanam. That is the great, the great scion of the leader, grandfather of, of that Raghu dynasty. And so this, this is a found in the Adhyatma Ramayana, uh, which is the Nando version of the Ramayana. <clears throat> and so this is available in English and in other languages to people, all the people of this day, which continues on this spiritual legacy of Ramchandra into this very day and time. So. Uh, we're bringing that up today in terms of uh, the quotes from Bhagavad Gita because Sri Krishna is in the next incarnation after Sri Ram, at least uh, of the 10 main avatars of India, in over a long periods of time called yugas. And so these great beings of one consciousness come back many times to help others. So I used to say that all the time, didn't I? It's not just one avatar that comes once, and there's not just uh, many avatars that come many times. There's one avatar that comes many times. They're cut from the same cloth, uh, that is divine awareness. There's no separations or divisions in divine awareness. You use that analogy of velvet cloth, and you just take a scissors and you cut out different shapes, and one shape's called Varaha, which I'll read for you in a minute. The Varaha Upanishad is where we find this teachings on the Jnana Bhumikas, uh, that means the boar. So the Lord incarnated as a boar at one time, and there was an Upanishad about him. Very beautiful Upanishad. We'll have to take it up a little bit long, but I think we could uh, condense it down into a retreat, as we have done for many of the other Upanishads, because it's just a, a, a total rendering of all the Vedanta teachings, plus Samkhya, plus Yoga, it shows you how vast uh, the Vedas were and how capacious the minds of those rishis were, even before these lineages of India uh, got uh, brought together under a title like like Samkhya or Yoga and Vedanta and so forth, and uh, how these great souls composed various scriptures in order to leave behind a record of those well, the record of our topic today is uh, the Jnana Bhumikas. That word Bhumika, I just actually read in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna was saying that a Bhumika means that like a ground or a foundation or a station. So I was talking about it Saturday at Satsang with a lot of us uh, who, were, who were there online with us about how these are, are like steps of a ladder. And uh, the chart I'll show you that is in footfalls of the Indian rishis, which you can all go running and look up and prepare yourself with. And and even after this class series is over, how many classes it may go, uh, you can look back and refresh yourself because it holds a lot of wisdom. It holds that highest wisdom we just called Atmagyan. Uh, and uh, Krishna is saying to Arjuna, his own disciple, devotee, how important it is that to, to get wisdom and knowledge first, to get rid of that ignorance so that you could say meditate, you could um, love more, more uh, purely, and you could also do your actions. The other three yogas, I've often said, if you have Gyatma Gyan for yourself, Gyana Yoga, and then the other three, Raja Yoga, which is basically meditation, and then Bhakti Yoga, which is basically your devotions, and Karma Yoga, your actions, those would be for the good of the world. Atmano Moksharcha Jigad Jitaya Cha, Vivekananda said, was his motto for the Ramakrishna order. Realization of, realization of the self and then for the good of the world. So that Ganam uh, that's been cited, the word's been always used three or four times in the first five minutes here, is a real requisite, particularly for the Vedantas and the Buddhists. And as Krishna said, those seekers of the highest truth, they really want to uh, take away that at the uh, problem of mulavidya, root ignorance, and, and then all other kinds of ignorance too, 
You could even say the lower knowledge poses a kind of ignorance to us, as you'll probably see as we look at the chart we're going to look at as a basic ladder to climb up by stages up and out of Maya. And that's a, a paraphrase of Sri Ramakrishna. The Gyanabhumikas are a ladder by which the soul raises himself up and out of Maya. So Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, he was aware, well aware of those and mentioned them in the gospel. Uh, M took it down and put it down for us. And now we had it, as I mentioned, in the source, as in the Varaha Upanishad, which I can read just a, a few slokas about. And then we have it in Lord Vashishta's Yoga Vashishta, which is in a much more expanded version. So these are both ancient, ancient, the sources I'll read from. You might have noticed in all the class series that I've been giving over the past year or two, the ones that are down to an hour instead of the three-hour ones we used to do with a break in between. I've been quoting from the scriptures in the first class only, and I've been trying to uh, not do that or read too much in the rest of the classes and just pretty much give the essence of the teachings through these charts and through my own knowledge and through the knowledge of my teachers. So and this being the first class of this series called the Jnana and Agyana, the Sapta, Agyana and Agyana Bhumikas, Sapta means seven. It's the number seven in Sanskrit. So Sapta, Agyana, there are seven levels of ignorance out of which the soul has to climb in this dream play of life. Uh, and we'll, we'll have some very interesting teachings on that that come both from Advaita and also from Mulavidya. Uh, we have to look at it from both sides now. Om Natatras. Uh, as we often tell, Oma Sat Vidyate, Bhava Nabhava, Vidyate Sataha, they looked at both uh, knowledge and ignorance to determine how the soul can, how they can raise the soul quickly out of darkness and delusion and uh, set them on the path to truth as quickly as possible. Um, just a, a mere act like, say, eating your breakfast as I was doing this morning, brought tears to my eyes because of all the people who are not who are suffering from hunger in the world. See, so uh, you may be enlightened, you may not be enlightened. Who can tell? And uh, but, but the only thing is, is that you, if you're a sensitive soul, then you're going to have uh, feelings for others. You don't want them to starve. You don't want them to suffer hunger. You don't want them to be thirsty when you can have. Most of us can have access to clean, pure water anytime we want, as if it's just uh, obvious that it's there for us. So that uh, that means these seers have that same kind of intensity um, in them. And they don't necessarily look at themselves as being enlightened. Sri Ramakrishna, they ask him, he said, I don't know anything about it. I only know that Divine Mother speaks through me and opens my mouth and does everything. So it came to my mind this morning as I, I was eating breakfast, you know, and, and putting it up in a God blog next week, um, uh, deeper into the red toy, I'm calling it, because the red toy story is rather famous in the Gospel of Ramakrishna for most beings who have read it, is that basically the child's playing with his red to toy, and then uh, he gets tired of it, throws it away, and calls out for his mother. Well, I read the full version of that. Sri Ramakrishna it was actually an experience of Sri Ramakrishna. He was taking care of his his uh, brother's child one day and uh, had to be with him all day. So Sri Ramakrishna, you know, taking care of this beautiful and very fortunate child to have be taken care, care of by an avatar, the way Ramachandra was taken care of by Vashishti, you might say. But this child was much younger and he watched uh, the, the child play with its red toy, a toy or two there. And Sri Ramakrishna said he watched it all day, and it was just totally engrossed in this red toy. And then darkness started to settle in, and it put the toys aside and started crying out for its mother, and nothing could console it. Nothing he could do could keep it from crying and crying out for its mother. And so what could he do? He started weeping. He felt so affected by this child's missing of his mother that he couldn't do anything about, that he started weeping along with the child. You could call that a kind of divine empathy. Uh, so the mother finally comes and the child's all 
placated and consoled, you see. So you could see how that became a story of Sri Ramakrishna that M took down later, Mahendranath Gupta, and put it in the Gospels, Sri Ramakrishna giving it in short form. But it's actually there in the Gospels as a full experience of Sri Ramakrishna. The beautiful part of that is that how he wept for the child's suffering. So you know, it doesn't matter, again, enlightened or non-enlightened, high or low. If you're a sensitive soul and you have that feeling for other beings, you don't want them to suffer, then you, know, you might as well call that a kind of enlightenment. So people come back with that kind of empathy, that kind of sensitivity for the sufferings of others and try and do everything to remove it. We'll see that even in parents and children in so-called worldly families, that the the parents are trying to save the children from as much suffering as possible. So it's just inbred in all souls, high or low, uh, awake or sleeping. So that has to do with this, um, this penchant for compassion that, that, that is there. Uh, and so that's why the seers look at the lower the Agyana Bhumikas too. They're listed instead of just the Gyana Bhumikas when I created this chart. Since the seven lower stages of, of knowledge, that is it's kind of a contradiction, but they actually call it lower stages of knowledge. It's actually seven stages of ignorance because knowledge hasn't, hasn't dawned yet. So we'll see. Uh, that's one of the things I was saying. For you, it's going to be very good to know that there are higher stages of wisdom for the mind to climb. You see, it's just like the limbs of yoga, see, or, or, or the steps, the, the stages of Buddhism and so forth. Uh, the, the mind has to have something to, to cut its teeth on, spiritually speaking. And so you don't even need to call that practice if you don't want to. You just say, that's what's to be done. It's time for me to go to the next level. So I won't brook any obstacles to it. I'm just going to move forward, go inward. Uh, so uh, most of us uh, in the press of trying to gain some sort of enlightened state of mind uh, probably can't have a lot of uh, of uh, easy commerce with stages of knowledge. They want it gone, and get thee behind me kind of thing. And so in that case, it's good for us to look back on how a soul comes up and out of darkness so that if we have children, or we have families, we have loved ones, or we just even meet strangers who are suffering, then we, we have a way in which to understand what they're going through at these lower levels. So I put the Agyana boom because Gyanam, wisdom, Agyanam, the opposite of wisdom, here as, as a list. And this is what's going to be our main chart, accompanied by other charts to show us how each of these little bubbles of teachings occur. Basically, according to Lord Vashishta's version of the Gana Bhumikas. But let's look at the Varaho Upanishad, since we're Vedantas and Vedanta means Upanishad. Um, let's find out um, from the source the few mentions, because the Bor Avatar, Varaha, uh, he just starts reading everything. What does he call it here? Very interesting. Um, the uh, 96 cosmic principles. So if you're used to 12 and you know, if you're used to 24 in Samkhya, if you're used to 36 in Shaivism, about the 96. Shall we look at them all? That's what Vishnu, the Lord, in, in a form of an animal this time, has is teaching Ribu. So the great sage Ribu, we know about him because he was teaching his son Nidaga in one of the other Upanishads we studied, and he appears in two or three of the Upanishads, father and son. He's the one that had the vision of Annapurna, and he meditated on her for 40 years and finally got her vision, the goddess. So Ribhu performed penis for 12 divine years. That's not just 12 earthly years, by the way. That's a long, much longer time. At the end of that time, the Lord appeared for him in the form of a boar and said, Rise, Ribhu, and choose your boon. The sage got up, having prostituted himself before the Lord, said, I will not in my dream wish of thee those things that are desired by the worldly. So he's saying, 
when I, when I'm seeking the Lord, I'm not seeking the Lord for any menial things. Like uh, even in my dreams, when I seek the Lord, I'm not trying to satisfy myself in paradise. I'm not trying to satisfy myself on earth. This great sage Ribu has already known that those things are paltry, insignificant, and unfulfilling. So he, it's a beautiful way he he always starts out when he talks to a great soul. He's saying that uh, not even my dreams will I ask you for anything worldly. All the Vedas, the Shastras, the Itihasas that I have studied, all the hosts of other sciences, as well as the science of Brahma and the gods, speak of emancipation as resulting from a knowledge of thy nature. So impart to me the science of Brahman, which treats my nature. Beautifully put, yeah. It's not like he wasn't unprepared for asking a boon, but it wasn't going to be of an ordinary kind. Sort of like Nachiketus in the Kato Upanishad, where he sees death and death tries to dissuade him from asking for knowing what's beyond death, but he won't be dissuaded. He wants that one thing which knowing all else is known, to quote the Upanishads. Um, so that's all I'm going to read. Uh, you can look up the Upanishad yourself if that interests you and intrigues you. But I will ju jump straight to uh, chapter 4 of this Upanishad and read you where the Ajnana Bhumikas occur. I think uh, first in time, uh, it depends on whether Vashishta's lifetime was prior to this Upanishad or after, and who can tell that in this day and time. So he's busy cons uh, asking Varaha, Vishnu in the form of a boar, uh, about different things in spiritual life, and and the Lord Vishnu is giving him all these teachings. Then jump to fourth chapter. On another occasion, um, he asked him to enlighten him as to the characteristics of a Jivan Mukti. What is a free soul? And uh, then the Lord replied the following. In the seven bhumikas, or stages of development of wisdom, there are four kinds of Jivan Muktas. Of these, the first stage is Subhecha, right desire. The second is Vicharana, inquiry into the nature of God. Reality. The third is Tanu Manasi, or pertaining to uh, uh, the weightless mind, the mind that's been stripped of, of weights. The fourth is Sattvapati, attainment of sattva, that is pure sattva. The fifth is Asam Shakti, non attachment. The sixth is Padartha Bhavana, analysis of all objects, outside and in. You look at the outside objects and you see how they came from the mind and you have samadhi with them, like Father of Yoga was later to write. And then you you understand the outside and the inside and then you can go beyond them both. And seventh, Turya, the fourth or final stage. Then the Bhumika, which is the form of Pranava or Om, is formed of and is divided into A, U, M. And these four kinds account for the four kinds of levels, stula, sukshma, bija, that means causal, and sakshi, witness. These four avastas are accompanied, are correlated to waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. You see how, uh, in just a few words, the ancient Vedanta that the Lord knows about, you know, is being read out very quickly and directly to a soul who is qualified to hear it. And um, otherwise, you may take all th three of those four things, plus the seven, and you start having to explain them to people to help qualify them. Here, again, you're doing this for compassion for them so that they won't suffer in ignorance later because they have not heard these teachings. And uh, they may attain some level of some quality somewhere, but uh, it might not be accompanied by the stages before it, and it might not be able to lead to the stages beyond it. So you want to make sure that it's given thoroughly. But when you're talking to Ribu and and uh, Nidaga, you don't really have to do that. You can just appear and say, they ask you a boon, you say, remember these teachings you had? Here's how you put them together. You ask what a Jiva Mukti is, that's what a Jiva Mukti is. So when we're studying this, 
um, this is what we're going to to reach, Toria. Uh, we, we talked about it. But we're going to have to go all the way down through um, deep sleep, dreaming, swapna, and waking state to grow up in order to find out how, uh, what's, how's it put here, inception of differentiation and incipient manifestation of the jiva happens. That is, uh, how a soul starts out in darkness. And you want to know the truth is the soul doesn't start out in darkness. It starts out in light. And then it comes into darkness. So life in the realm of name and form and time and space that occurs karma, that's that insinuation of maya. And if you come into the world and you, you don't have a teachers like illumined par parents, like Nidaga did with Ribu, then you're you're going to fall uh, fall into that darkness. You're going to run afoul of the the teachings and never hear them. Then you start believing that you were born in darkness. You see how it is? Like say you're a sinner, and then nobody's told you your atma is perfect. So the person who comes up and says you're a sinner, if you've heard the truth of the Vice Vedanta, no, that can't be possible. I'm I'm pure and perfect in my nature. But if you haven't heard that and contemplated it from the lips of an illumined perceptor, then you're going to be taken aback and you're going to start uh, worrying about it. Remember that uh, God blog teaching last week. This is where uh, where uh, Shamakrishna says the uh, the Lord appears before a sleeping man and wakes him up and says, "Here I am." So it's, it's like that. If, if you have this awakening early on, then these teachings that are of a more negative kind are, are going to be actually positive to you. Uh, you're going to see how um, there were dreams you once had. And you'll, we'll see that as we climb out of waking into dreaming in ignorance. Because there's a kind of dreaming that happens later that's in, in uh, consciousness. You're dreaming higher dreams. As both Vivekananda and Sri Aurobindo said, you, know, you awake from these dreams. If you can't awake fully yet, then awake to higher levels of dream. So it's sort of like your knowledge is sort of like that because Brahman is beyond knowledge. So the knowledge is just going to be used as a stage or a step to help you remember your true nature, which already is. It was there before you started climbing. It was there um, after you climbed. It was there along the way of the climb. Uh, uh, just ask um, Queen Chudala from two or three weeks ago how walking the skies happened to her. She, she wasn't weighted down. She didn't have heavy weights on her like like uh, Baraha is, is telling Ribu there. Um, so that's what I wanted to read from the scriptures to get us started on uh, where the source of the Jnana Bhumikas are. Now let's take Lord Vashishta's version. Like I said, it's really not going to be able to chronologically say which happened first, uh, Ribu's vision of Varaha or uh, Ram's approaching Vashishta to hear these teachings. But basically, um, uh, the teaching of that Vashishta is giving to Ram comes from a story of Swayambhuvamana giving this teaching uh, to Iksvaku. So Iksvaku is a great king of the solar line. He meditates. He has a vision of Swayambhuvamana. That's the highest manu of, of, and, uh, um, of, of the level of Lord Brahma. And then uh, many centuries later, maybe millennia later, these teachings are in, as the Varaha Upanishad said, uh, Ribhu said, you know, I've studied the Upanishads, I've studied the Shastras, I've studied um, the Itihasas, uh, and now I'm qualified to know and ask, what is a Jivan Mukta? Because now you tell me what a Jivan Mukta is, a living, liberated soul, I'm going to get it. If if you had it told me what it was before I studied these scriptures, I wouldn't have had the foggiest. That's how important um, these scriptures, the Shastras are in India. What are we saying? Nahi Ginena Sudrishyam Pavitram Iha Vijate. I just chanted at the beginning of the class. All seekers of truth must know that this Atmagyan destroys ignorance. 
It's the most, it's the best purifier in the world. So you wouldn't want to go anywhere to see a guru unless you'd done some work yourself. I spent at least 10 years, 11 years studying the scriptures before I met Swami Shishananda. And so I had primed my mind, you know, to know what he was talking about. That's why when he started talking, I knew it was the truth. I didn't have any doubts or fears about it. I just accepted it point blank. Who else said that? Josephine McLeod, when she first heard Swami Vivekananda at the Sesame Club, you see, in England. Oh, when I first heard Swami Vivekananda speak, I know that he was speaking the truth. His first words were truth. And I heard him the rest of my life. He spoke nothing but truth. See? So she had been one of these beings who had gotten interested in the teachings and was looking for a great soul to explain them to her. So this is a transmission that's going on that's very important, and it qualifies you. And, and this qualification can happen by degrees. So um, in here, uh, King Iksvaku, remember a story being told about King Iksvaku by, by uh, Lord Vashista to the young Sri Ram as he was asking Swayambhavamana. This is the way the Indian scriptures are. There's stories inside of stories because it's so long lived, has such longevity that uh, these souls are always pulling out these um, great teachings from the store of wisdom, Gyan, Atma Gyan, because it's worked before to illumine souls, it can work again, see? But that qualification of the seeker has to be there. It's a really important part of it. So uh, King Iksvaku asks, Reverend Sir, that's he's asking, Iksvaku uh, Swayam Bhuvamana. Reverend Sir, how is it, how is this rare Ganam that is so coveted by the seers and sages to be had by ordinary people? Is it not inaccessible, even unapproachable to mortal beings? And the answer comes back, it's difficult of access, my son, to persons of callow minds, clouded minds, and complicated minds. But to those who both are both adroit and perspicacious, this rare ganum is attainable. And it occurs to them in seven distinct but interconnected stages. I will outline those for you now, as this is a great teaching conducive to enlightenment. If you're looking at this version of, of Yoga Vishishta, that starts on page 207 in the story of Iksvaku. So, Gathering his thoughts, Swayambhuvamana then embarked on elucidating. He says, uh, he starts talking about all of these stages. The first is Subhecha. The second is Vicharana, uh, ceaseless inquiry. And the third is, uh, is um, Tanumanasa. Uh, inner the the uh, fruition of inner knowledge. So I'm giving you this so you can play it off against the way Lord Vishnu described it in one or two sentences uh, to uh, Ribu. Um, Then there's sattvapati level. Intelligence is the name of the game here, uh, where subtle vasanas and samskaras, so hard to detect earlier, show themselves up for destruction. Now, that's very beautiful. That's, again, what, what um, Lord Vishnu was telling Ribu. That's the attainment of sattva. So if you want to know what pure sattva is, it's when you start seeing what's happening to you, if you see. Basically, you see your past births, and uh, you begin to awaken from the dream of life. We'll get to this by by stages, and then all of a sudden you're launched into this first level of subhacha, which all with all of its concomitants. It's very beautiful the way it's put here and later. Um, those are four levels of higher awareness, and you remember that in the 
Varahu Upanishad, he started out talking about the four qualifications of teacher. I'll bring that chart later in this series because the seven levels of consciousness, seven levels of Gyanabhumikas are spread out over four levels of teacher. Some teachers only have the first two. Some teachers have four. Some teachers have six, and the great teachers have all seven. So uh, that's a very beautiful teaching that the seven Gyanabhumikas fall inside or over the spectrum of four kinds of liberated souls. So, so it gets all very interesting, and you know, the, and, the inquiring students want want to want to know that, so they can get the highest teachings. And so we uh, we go through these different levels of knowledge, uh, four of them, and we also know that they connect with uh, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, and turiya, generally four states of levels of our consciousness. That's your consciousness, by the way. He's talking about your your uh, your, your waking, your sleep, and then you're in deep sleep. You're waking, you're dreaming, and then you're in deep sleep. And for the ordinary soul, which is the nature of the question being asked here, and, you know, remember, uh, uh, isn't it very hard and unapproachable for mortal minds to understand this? So this is why I was saying four, four stages of consciousness aren't just for the, the uh, realized souls. Every soul has those. You wake, you dream, you go into deep sleep, you come back to waking. But most ordinary souls don't go into Turiya, or samadhi when they do this waking, dreaming, deep sleep round all the time. And so that's why they quickly connect this to the four levels of teacher and then to the four states of your own consciousness. This is the hands-on Vedanta. And really, this is Advaita Vedanta that you're approaching. These are the, the real steps to the, the ultimate truth. We'll see that uh, when we talk about uh, birth and and karma and uh, darkness. So this is a kind of introduction. I won't go into all of Lord Vashish's teachings because it gets much more involved than than uh, what Sindhi Varaho Upanishad. But let's make sure that we can move on into the uh, main teachings of the chart because in the first class, as I said, I very much like to um, start you off with some scriptural reference. And these are available. You can you can find the Varaha Upanishad, and you can find like a SRV a version of Yoga Vishishta. And I'll expect these for yourself. The first of the Agyana Bhumikans is called Bindu Jagrat. So we know that that's that's this. Uh, Bindu, you know, means like this very first uh, inception. Like Bindu appears a very high thing, it's like third eye Bindu. But when you just use the word Bindu, generally speaking, then it's it's a very, you know, it's a, it's just a, a point. So it's just a point of worldliness, the point of ignorance in the world, Bindu Jagrat. And you can see what happens here to the soul. It's a, it's a root state of ignorance. They call that Mula Avidya. And uh, it happens to be the incipient manifestation of the jiva. Now, here's a, a very powerful teaching about darkness, maya, ignorance, samsara, and questions that are always coming up in people's minds, how did I get here? And some, maybe somebody with a little bit higher aspirations say, who am I? But that's not occurring to most people that, how did I suffer? How did I get into this state of suffering? Or maybe it's, it's like, oh, can I get more happiness? You know, can I have more money? Can I have more lands? Can I have more things you know, to satisfy me and so forth? So a different level of questioner also, question and questioner also goes in these. When you say incipient manifestation of the jiva, that's where you needed to have a realized soul talk to you at the beginning of your life. Because as my teacher used to say, from cradle to the grave, most beings are in ignorance. They're in this, these lower levels of ignorance, and they never come out of them. That's many lifetimes. So Cradle of the Grave is just talking about one lifetime that Swami Sheshananda Ji Maharaj, my illumined teacher, 
peace and bliss be upon him, said in some of his lectures to us from in the Vedanta Society uh, when I was going there. So when we say you needed a, an illumined teacher, then what we say is, uh, we're going to segue to this chart um, to understand this. It's a beautiful image in the back, this huge sinkhole that the ocean is flowing into. Uh, when I saw it, I said, oh, that's perfect to describe the, the downfall of the soul into karma and some scars and suffering and so forth. And so I used it and superimposed over it all of these teachings. But we're not going to take a long time to go through it. We're going to keep following this course. We're going to go through it enough to make the point that when you say incipient manifestation of the jiva is in a very dark place, that's, um, that's a dream of the world, of your body that you're having. It's not a reality. So when you go to Lord Vashishta, he'll start you off with a teacher like this. See, a teaching like this says, um, his own quote, jivas, embodied beings, rise out of Brahman state with no cause. But cause and effect come to them due to performing desire-based karmas. So it's just another way of saying, you're the Atman and you're perfect. You have no cause and effect in you. Don't you know, we hear that teaching short form all the time from our gurus who are who have any knowledge of non-duality at all? Oh, you're pure and perfect. These things are just things that are passing. They're ephemeral. They're transitory. They're not real. It's not essential. Don't brood on them. You have all sorts of ways to approach the psyche for uh, being able to stay clear of believing in the reality of the unreal. Because that's the that's the definition of Maya, you know, that takes the real and it makes it seem unreal, and then takes the unreal and makes it seem real. So people get attached to unreal things. People at this level, you see. So, incipient nature of the jivas means that some souls enter in here, at the muladhara chakra, and take their births here. Animals do, and uh, humans uh, that are hell bound, you see, that are suffering and that are evil-minded also take their births in a, a very low state with no realization of their true nature. So I hope you understand what I'm saying here when we're talking about this is not you. Uh, it's, if it's a state you went through, then it means that you just were never told and never aware that you don't have any cause. You're thinking of yourself as a transmigrating unit instead of an eternal principle. You're believing in the uh, the illusion of birth, growth, disease, old age, decay, and death, and you've taken it seriously. Therefore, in your next lifetime, if you live the whole lifetime like that, because remember, Sri Ramakrishna said that uh, beings who believe in the reality of the world, then they're born in the world many times because they've become convinced that the, the world's the only reality. That's where this happens. I hope I've made this really clear right now to everyone watching, everyone here in class, because this is a very important distinction to make between what you're, th what you're dreaming and who you are. And uh, you'll see as we climb out of this together that um, it might remind you of souls you met. It probably doesn't apply to you if you're already in front of a teacher uh, and, and already versed in the scriptures and already have some years under your belt, and you're, you're gathering in the Atma again, you know, it's making an effect on you, then it doesn't really fully apply to you. However, I'd like to say that it really does apply to sensitive people who want to um, remove suffering from others, like children when they're born. It's going to be important for everyone to know this, uh, so, so that uh, that that suffering can be removed at its root early, as, as early as possible, before belief in dream becomes uh, accented. Following on here, you can see how I, this one quote by Lord Vashishta inspired a diagram. So the Brahman state is there, and then you can see how 
jivas rise out of Brahman. So they're not born in, in ignorance, unless they've had many lifetimes of ignorance. They actually come forth out of Brahman, according to Lord Vashishta. And when they come forth out of Brahman, rise from Brahman, then they have these options, you see. The Jivan Muktas have one lifetime, and then they return to Brahman. Uh, and then they might come back again after they've seen the truth of the matter. They might come back again to help souls who have fallen into this sinkhole, you see, um, of samsara, you might call it. But there's also the Jivan Muktas. You see, they, they only take one lifetime as if to open the third eye, or maybe they are helping the collective consciousness just by their appearance. Like Lord Buddha at the end of his life, I'm gone and gone forever, right? Don't have any hope for me. Don't You don't want to see me again, you see. Uh, he might send back some of his Buddha emanations, but he himself is one with Buddha nature. And so these are souls that are videha muktas. They're they're one and done, as the expression was just used earlier today. So you want to have that knowledge of, of the difference between a videha mukta, videha free of deha bodies, and jivan muktas, living liberated while in bodies. That Those are the two highest kinds of souls. These are transmigrating souls in darkness. And these are seekers. These are souls that are seeking and getting out of darkness. So you can see how there's a kind of a great hierarchy here. There's these illumined souls that are, are one and done. If they know their consciousness at all times, it'll be hard to convince them to even take a body. Then there's these souls that will come out of Brahman in full cognizance of who they are, and those are the Jivan Muktas, who have Jivan Mukti, living liberated. Then you have the seekers who are seeking to get to a level of Jivan Mukta, uh, a level of Jivan Mukti. And then you have these gradations of souls who have, because of their karmas and their distractions and their desires and so forth, have fallen into these dreams. So you can see how, how um, dicey you see, this dream life is. It's that you could be born in a dream. Even when you're in a waking state, you could be dreaming. And you'd be convinced that you're ignorant. You'd be convinced that there's no God. You'd be convinced that you don't have a true nature. There's no such thing as a soul. That the world is the only reality. That the only thing that will satisfy me is money and objects and lands and power. And I don't care how you get it. Uh, I don't care how much I cause suffering to others getting it. This is all how they're born into. If a soul begins to come out of these levels of Gyanabhumika, they begin to waken up to who they are. That is, that who that they don't like themselves. That's the ego. The ego becomes so pronounced, and we'll see that individuation is also beginning to happen here, you see. So you're beginning to become aware of yourself as an individual. You might think that's a teaching of positivity, not here. You see, it's the individual you want to get rid of as you graduate. So like Holy Mother said, Forget your personality. Remember your true self. Because at the level of people were coming to her, who were very fortunate people, she was helping them diminish their egos, not try and make themselves individuals who thought themselves to be separate from nature, and then try to get power over nature. These, I'm, I'm jumping ahead here, but to give you an advanced explanation of how, how the soul is experiencing itself and not liking what it sees. If it likes what it sees, you know, it's like Krishna saying in the Gita, be indifferent to the evil, right? There are four kinds of attitudes that you can develop. And you can, you know, you can you can support and love other beings and, and God, and you can uh, you can be compassionate for those who suffer and so forth. But for the evil, he just says, be indifferent. They're not going to respond, so you don't go there. Very few souls will go there and try and help those souls because they're just going to try and use that soul to get their evil end satisfied. So that is, is something that you just kind of uh, leave alone. And it, you might remember when Vishishta first counseled Ram 
that Vashishtha himself had been put in the state of Maya by Lord Brahma, his father, and Lord Brahma had, had taken had put him under a spell of Maya. And Vashishtha came out of that spell of Maya when Brahman lifted and said, What did you do to me? I felt horrible. Well, that's how the people in the world feel. So I wanted you to have that experience. You'd have compassion for them because you're going to have a birth now down on earth. That's your next assignment, as it were. May talk about mission impossible, right? So uh, basically, Vashishta got reborn, and the main reason was to counsel the avatar of the age. So it wasn't all bleak and dark, was it? He was there to help Sri Ramchandra realize his avatarhood at a very young age. So this is all woven into this great Ram Leela with Sita and Hanuman and Lakshmana and, and Lord Vashishta and Lord Vishwamitra. It's, it's, it's just this ancient, beautiful, complete story of divine manifestation and form. It's, just, it's like um, almost incomparable. So now we've explained uh, Brahman's state. And now you're convinced, right, if you weren't before, oh, I just come out of Brahman, I go back to Brahman. That's it. I'm just Brahman. See? Say no more. Game over. But what about all the souls, and how do we explain to these dark worlds that people are being reborn into? They're dreaming themselves into ignorance. They're dreaming themselves into dark minds. They're dreaming themselves into physical bodies. Some of the teachings say even lower than human bodies. They'll dream themselves into those like animals, insects. It's like you having a dream of being a moth one night. It's not such an impossible uh, thing, is it, that to, to envision or imagine that? Because you had a dream of it. Well, that's what they're having dreams of, these different forms. So if we come down here, you can see that um, jivas that rise out of Brahman uh, engage in mental projection and associate with maya. So there's the you, know, you might call it the primal error, is that unless you're accompanied by the eternal companion, unless you're aware of the Divine Mother as your guide, because these beings have previous lifetimes in darkness, but these beings could have previous lifetimes in light. So if they come down the same process, they're not falling victim to the six transformations, to the to the illusion of growth and illusion of birth and death. They're aware of themselves all the time as great souls. So they'll, as it were, you know, follow these souls into darkness and help retrieve them from it. So you can see from there, and just follow the chart yourself on the screen or here in, in the classroom, then that's where uh, uh, it's realized by some souls that Oh, yes, we're falling into Maya, but those light field souls are going to say, but yes, that's Brahman's Maya. See, so uh, a lot of conventional religions can't go there. Uh, but um, India takes that stance and says, there's this, um, there's this poison in the snake, but it doesn't exist outside the snake. So you can't say it has an independent existence. So evil doesn't have its own independent existence, like an incarnate devil or something. It's all coming out of Brahman. And I've made this conclusion based on the wisdom of my teachers. And now when I come into Maya, I say, oh, that's just Brahman's Maya, you see. And I don't have to fall victim to it. I can just walk through it. Later on, Father Vyoga will come to you and say, walk amongst the sense objects. Just don't get attached to them. So, I mean, from the, from the ancient times in India right on up to more recent times in Father Vyoga's appearance in around 140 A.D., and then you're getting these teachings of beings who can come into Maya and just call it Brahman's Maya and not get all philosophically convoluted about it. Like Maya has its own existence or, you know, uh, that it's real. See, it's not real. It's unreal. Or sometimes they say it's, it seems to be real, but it's also unreal. And then they'll step back and say, it seems to be real. It seems to be unreal. And it seems to be a contradiction. It seems to be both. And then they'll step back there and say, it seems to be both, but then it seems to be neither, too. <laughs> so by the time you get to it's neither, you've got a soul that knows it inside out, knows this like the back of his hand see, in the process, and is just um, indifferent to the evil and uh, in an ever-awake state. 
that cannot fall into sleep and dream anymore, and knowest the nature of, of bijam. Bijam means causal state. Uh, in, a, in the Upanishad, I just talked to you about that. He said, you have to become aware of the gross, uh, the subtle, and the bijam. The bijam means causal. Everything comes from a seed. So that's, you know, we're trying to look for a word in English for that, so we call it causal, and we try and assign that causal to our deep sleep state because we're trying to figure out how objects got formed, and we're going to nature and seeing nature could do it by itself somehow, but consciousness had no part in it, so you've got this loggerheads between science and, and uh, the science of philosophy in India, and you can't make, you, you get caught in that kind of a, of a problem. So uh, there's, a, there's a solution for it right there. I said you can, you can see that this, this um, source or origin to all things is in your own consciousness. That's what we're studying, basically. You know, the, take the four states of your own awareness and lay it over this, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, and Turiya. It's even built into the, the names of the stages of knowledge. So that's how ancient and, and how certain it is. So just say Brahman's Maya, coming down from that, uh, they perform action with desire. Uh, now we're talking about the incipient manifestation of the jiva, right? They start engaging in action and um, they're doing it with desire. Notice the name of the chart, desire, karma, samskaras, and rebirth. Basically, if you were just to stay here, you, would, you wouldn't have to say anything. None of, that wouldn't be a prop, appropriate title for the top part of this chart. I just say, existence in Brahman. I am Brahman. I am that would be the title for the chart. So saying that this is the very important part of everything, the Advaitic or non-dual part is that thou art that. And your forgetfulness of that has led to this. And when it led to this, it was never real. Your suffering wasn't real. Your ignorance wasn't real. The karmas and actions you did was not real. And the births and deaths you suffered were not real. The suffering you caused to others were not real. You only believed in them in a, in a state of, of separation from your true nature. And that got convoluted and, co and, and uh, exacerbated see, over time leading to some sorrow. Well, if you've never heard the non-dual truth, you can see what, what a state you would be in. And what would you call that state? This millennia. What you see all around you, people uh, not believing in God, don't know their own soul, malcontent, brooding, depressed, suicidal, taking drugs, all of those things are, are results of, of being separated from your true self, which, which has everything you need in it. That's the fulfilling state, Brahman, Atman. And the Gyanam will help lead you back there in case you've forgotten. So Brahman's Maya, performance of action with desire, yes, those beings who want to stay free and they have some wherewithal, they'll do good actions. Uh, mixed actions, they'll be very careful of. Those are very confusing. And of course, negative actions are for those souls who are very ignorant. And karma accrues. No matter what kind of action you do, karma accrues. If you're talking about a jivan mukta coming to this level, you're talking about a soul who says, all, all action takes place in nature, not in me. So I've kept my actions very pure, and their result has come from them but it hasn't bound me, see. All worlds, both here and there, do I renounce, see. All heavens, all earths, all hells, all hopes and fears, go beyond good and bad, go beyond pleasure and pain, life and death, and realize your true nature. They're keeping this in mind, even when they act in front of us, knowing that all action takes place in Prakriti, not in the Purusha, if you want to put it in ancient time ancient language. So because of this actions people do, 
there's an accrual of karma. What's that actually mean? Nicely put here. Pleasure and pain from repeated activities leave residue in your mind. If you could go through all activities with no desire for pleasure and no fear of pain, you wouldn't have any karma. This is how they do it. So they're not seeking pleasure, nor are they shunning pain. Who gave that teaching? That's the father of yoga, Patanjali. You neither seek pleasure nor do you shun pain. Where else is it? It's in the song of Sanyasin, the Vivika, Swami Vivekananda wrote. All, you know, all pain and pleasure. You know, so basically, you know, uh, do not seek pleasure, go beyond pain, and then realize your true self. So uh, other beings in this darkness, of course, all their actions are resulting in pain and pleasure because that's what they're seeking from objects is pleasure. And the pain comes to them unasked. And so it takes them off guard. That's a residue in the mind. Call it fear, call it brooding, call it disappointment, call it non-fulfillment. It gets to the mind and causes them to do more erratic actions. So further down, the, the samkaras have already kicked in. That's why these beings are born the way they are. And there's some samkaras based on their desires. Look at the 12 Nidanas of Buddhism, and you'll see how that this these 14 levels, or at least these higher seven levels, are much like those Nidanas of Buddhism, the higher to lower levels, is that they're going through these links and chains that cause other things, that cause other things. And so we just said here is that, you know, cause comes to them because of desire-based actions, right? So he started us out with that. So this is this is explaining the samsaric wheel. It's also explaining why some souls are reborn in ignorance and suffering, and other souls are reborn good, and other souls are reborn neither good nor bad. They're just born to help others. And some souls have that compassion that wants to help all souls out of suffering. They don't want to see anyone hungry. They don't want to see anyone thirsty. They don't want to see anyone in pain doesn't matter if they're good or bad. It just it shouldn't happen. It's not necessary. And mostly, pleasure and pain has been what's caused people to be bad, seeking it, seeking pleasure, uh, which doesn't, which gets, uh, doesn't get fulfilled, and then uh, receiving pain uh, without knowing where the source of it. It's coming from their own karmas, you see. But they'll quickly blame other people. They'll blame God if they even believe in God. Or they'll create an incarnate devil and blame him. So all of this is really self-actuated. It's a good word, two words in English. It all comes from the self and the actions that the self's engaging in, devoid of consciousness, higher consciousness. These samskaras uh, form good karma, mixed karma and negative karma. So beings here are born of those karmas. And then you can see the different kinds of beings there uh, at rebirth. Those who have good karmas, they have higher lifetimes. Those who have skandhas of mixed karmas are uh, of a kind of intermediate quality of life. And then those who have negative karmas, of course, they'll come out violent, deluded, impaired, diseased, and so forth. And this is all based, of course, on, on um, the way that they took their birth and what they did in their previous lifetime. So many lifetimes can go by in this state over ages. And this is called Kali Yoga, Age of Darkness. So we can see how um, condensed that darkness has become and how averse to light people are, uh, averse to practice. We were reading Sri Ramakrishna the other day, and he said, most people are just averse to spiritual practice. So he learned that. He was just saying it matter-of-factly, matter-of-factly. Uh, sort of, he wasn't saying, oh, gee, I wish they would get busy in practice. He just saw that that's the way they were. They, weren't, they were averse to practice. Um, so, yeah, let's read the final quote, and then we can say that we we pretty much took this lower level or two levels and, and explained it of the Agyana Bhumikas. Shisha then tells Ram, those who long for 
objective existence will attain it via their own projections. But those who strive for yoga will perceive objects as being devoid of substance and will refrain from desire. That's what I said when we were talking about here. Imagine if you could do action for neither pleasure nor pain. You were a verse, you were a sum shakti, as we're going to say, talk about later. You know, that you're just uh, 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 not accessible to the effects of those actions because they haven't been done with desire. Everything has been done automatically, devoid of desire, as a matter of course. This, you can find this chart if you want to look at it longer and deeper in the footfalls of the Indian rishis. Let's go back here now and pick up these lower stages of agyanam. We said number one, it's really we're talking about 14 here, aren't we? Number 14 is the lowest of all of these 14 stages, if you want to put them together. So born in a root state of ignorance, why? Can you all tell me now why they are born that way? Now do you know the nature of ignorance? Now do you know why people suffer? Now do you know why some people aren't like you are? Uh, everyone watching, you're all so high and enlightened, right? Full of light. So you've escaped the lower rumikas, and you're, you're looking at higher grounds, attain higher grounds. But don't ever let anyone come back and tell you now that, um, that, that there's no cause for, for this. Ultimately, there's no cause. But the reason why they're suffering is that they engaged in cause and effect through actions. And then they're born that way the next time. So since you don't see their previous births, and you probably don't even see yours yet, until a higher level of knowledge dawns on you, then you're caught up short trying to explain it. But these seers are not caught up short trying to explain it. They, they'll tell you directly, but you have to be qualified to hear it. This is like Divine Mother filter. You could speak the highest truth at some people, and it'll just go over their heads. It's like mother put a filter there. They're not ready to hear it. You might as you're wasting your breath. You see, you can talk non-duality till you're blue in the face, like Vishnu, unintended, but they're not going to hear it. So, don't tell you I didn't give you very good answers for two things here: why people are ignorant, and then why you see them suffering. Let's go to uh, stage two of the Agana, or 13. Awareness of individuation. I think I can already assume that when we talk about the ego, that, that it's not such a good thing to say that in spiritual circles, is that, oh, I'm, I know myself as an individual now. Well, you know, in psychology, Western psychology and so forth, with therapy and all that, there are some souls that they're trying to work with who are trying to realize them, they're trying to separate themselves out from a mass of misidentification of things. So that's what you call uh, becoming an individual. You see, we've heard that back in the 60s, 70s, and so forth. So, Jagrat, it's in the word. It's in the world, right? Basically. And uh, people are beginning to see themselves as separate from everything else. So the next entry here after awareness of individuation is inception of differentiation. So now they're calling themselves different um, from both nature and from you and from God. And these souls uh, that are in the Brahman state and return to the Brahman state naturally, they're not saying that. They're saying, you and I are one. The world is in me and I'm one with God. I and my father are one, isn't it? So you can see what a vast difference there is about a person who knows the, the um, indivisibility of consciousness and those who are in a fragmented state uh, of uh, ego life. And uh, they're not connecting nature to their thoughts. Like, like we say at Satsang yesterday, we were talking about the, that uh, a lot of beings haven't made that connection that objects are just projections of the mind. The whole world's a projection of the mind. Let's move on because we're just getting out of darkness as quickly as we can. 
So number 12 or number three of the Agyana Bhumikas is the Mahajagrat. Progression of progression of repeated rebirths and believes man and universe to be dissimilar. You see, then they call about the 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 um the difficulty of the razor's edge path because some of these individuation if you're at a higher level all right you say that's a bad thing but if you're not at that higher level you say that's a good thing i'm realizing myself to be an individual see what i mean maya how maya works it's the same here when you say believes the universe and the self to be dissimilar so that's a that's a bad thing at this point but it's a good thing for the gani yeah i'm not like the universe at all but the gani is saying the universe has come out of me the Agyani does not know the universe has come out of his mind. I don't think I can put it any clearer than that. Um, and that explains that particular stage. Mahajagrat is the person that's in the world in a very big way, if you want to, want to say that. And they're beginning to, to see themselves and the universe as two distinct things. And what gets in, what, what comes next? Desire for it. It's separate from me, so I want it. But the Agani is saying, that came out of me. I already have it. See what I mean? Do I see nodding heads here? It's just, it's just, you know, the difference between a more enlightened soul and a less enlightened soul, if you want to put it gently. And that's why these, it's good to study these Agyanabhum, because side by side with the Ganabum, because we could have just jumped into these seven. I could have done the whole class on those and just, you know, giving you all the benefit for knowing that, you know, you're already coursing along in your spiritual life with lots of years under your belt. But Holy Mother said, you know, now that you've found Sri Ramakrishna and you're free, would you please turn and help others on your way to him? So we might be on our way to him, oneness with the Lord, Atman and Brahman being one in our realization, but we're supposed to take some up with us, you see. Wouldn't you do that for your children? So aren't all the beings of the world your children? Didn't Holy Mother say they're all my children? Even the evil, she said. I am the, I am the mother of the good. I am the mother of the evil, she said. She didn't make a distinction based on some being in a lowly position and some being in a high position. If the baby soils itself, she'll she'll wipe it off, take the diaper off, clean it, put a new clothes on. It doesn't matter whether the soul, the baby is bad or good, a good baby or a bad baby, an easy baby or a hard baby. She cleans it no matter what. Same with souls then, and the Divine Mother, the way she'll take up souls and, and help them again and again. And this is that compassion we were talking about earlier in class, that you just don't want to see people suffer. That's Mahajagrat in a nutshell. But we can't, uh, we've gone quickly to that third, but we need to stop and show you a little bit about rebirth. Because it was the name of the chart we just looked at desires, karmas, some scars, and rebirth. Now, in this chart, we can see that it's basically refinement of consciousness. Krishna puts it in this way. So um, let's take a little time here at the 12th level of uh, Ajnana Bhumika, which is the third uh, of the, all the Bhumikas, which is the third level of ignorance. I think you're probably all getting that as we're putting them all together in 14 stages. Nice picture of Vishnu there. Good, because we just had him in a different form, counseling the, the sage Ribu and his son, Daga. So the, when we look here then at, at awareness of, of rebirth, it's, it's a progression of repeated rebirths is happening. You know, the, the thing about that is that um, we know in the West, particularly in this day and time, we probably don't believe in rebirth. But I found when I was 
communing and talking and even just being in the presence of people who weren't spiritual spiritual oriented they said they'll make comments that that uh indicate that they do believe that they've had other lifetimes so it's sort of common knowledge that you have but it's just not talked about your parents never talked about it and uh you know the idea being maybe maybe it's it's one of the higher levels of knowledge in ignorance is that you should put your mind on this lifetime and not think about that see because you're not concentrated yet so if you start thinking about other lifetimes you're not going to be a success in this one so yeah we get it we get that there's a kind of practicality to teaching children to focus on the one lifetime they have probably even some spiritual devotees are like that so don't think about that so much i've had people come and question me I mean, I've had mother lifetimes. Tell me more about it. And then pretty soon it's like, okay, I've told you enough, you know, just kind of accept it and start working on this lifetime <laughs> to remove your karmas, you see, and do these things that will, that if you get the enlightenment from these practices, I won't have to tell you about it now or later. And the next lifetime, you won't be born as the incipient manifestation of a, of a dull soul, you'll be born in a higher level. Call it higher chakra, if you want. You'll take birth in a higher level of Gyanabhumika, a higher ground. You're, you're actually born there. It's not something you have to go through again. So you find out about these things, and then you make them a part of your store of knowledge, and that knowledge becomes more and more refined. It's the same with the birth of the body. That is, body means body-mind mechanism. That's what's transmigrating. The first soul, first question to answer both people with very little under, very little spiritual understanding and people with an argumentative intellect around things that they've studied in spirituality are going to come forward and say, um, um, are going to argue about the existence of these lifetimes. See? And... Uh, as I said, some people are sort of taking it for, for granted that they've had births amongst the, the more common run of minds, as as uh, Baraha, the Boer avatar, was saying. So basically, among thousands of beings, scarcely one strives for perfection, is how Krishna puts it in the Gita. And of those who strive and succeed, scarcely one of those knows me in truth. You can see that this is really thinning the field of eight billion souls on, on earth, <laughs> how many of them are here, and on how many of them are here, and how many of them are here, and how many of them are here. Uh, if, you know, if uh, millions of souls, only one of them is serious about finding their way out of darkness, and I take a million of those, and only one of those succeeds in finding its way out of darkness, and actually getting some realization, and then you try and take those two together, and maybe you say, well, that's marvelous. How about let's call it Brahmanandam, Shivam, Shantam, Premanupam, Niranjanam, Yogisham, Adbhutam, Nichim, Akhanud, Vacha, Lakshanam, Vigyanam, Trigunatitam, Turiya, Veda, Samgitam, Subodham, Sharadam, Chayava, Virkashashi, Bhushanam. How about the 16 direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, the most recent collection of great souls that we can say are one in millions on this earth? And what are they trying to tell us? What are they trying to teach us? Um, and how much it's in accord with the old teachings of Lord Vishishta and Vishnu and Krishna and the Gita and so forth. So that's what you have to look at here of uh, the Racer's Age path. And you want to be a candidate for uh, being an, an infinitely wealthy with all of Divine Mother's wisdom. The song Ram Prasad sings, I want to be infinitely wealthy with all your wisdom, mother. Uh, so this is an avaricious soul. I mean, it's got a huge appetite for the highest things. So here's how Krishna puts this process as far as the body-mind mechanism. Remember, transmigrating soul is a good thing to call these beings. They're born in ignorance, they live in ignorance, they die in ignorance. If by chance they, God intervenes in the form of a good teacher or a good set of parents and so forth, well, you'll see when we go down it, then things start to change. That is, the 
the condition of the soul starts to change and the atmosphere of the mind starts to change. So how does he put it? Through good actions, that's we go back. If they've fallen and they're working their way up and out of this, through good actions, then are born they are born in the worlds of the righteous. He says, neither in this world nor in the next is there destruction for the doer of good. My son never comes to grief. So they've made this jump, you might say, to morality. And they've given up the, uh, the difficult propositions of rebirth and ignorance. I mean, as it's Ram's birthday tomorrow and the next day, then we can put it that way. <laughs> Itani vinati ragunandana se dukha dhanva hamara bitao ji Itani vinati ragunandana se dukha dhanva hamara bitao ji dukha dhanva hamara bitao ji dukha dhanva hamara bitao ji this is my prayer to thee, Raghunanda, Raghunanda's Ram, whose birthday is tomorrow. Kindly destroy my mind's tendency to perceive duality and remove all sufferings and sorrows arising in my being. For Atman alone abides. Nothing else exists. It is attachment to relativity that gives birth to the miseries of life. So um, all this time I've been attached to my ego, to my things, to my objects, to the world. Alas, for me, I've never been attached to Brahman, who sang that. Shankara in his Bhaja Govindam, Bhaja Govindam. So Dulcidas, um, you know, he's got, he's got a version of of Vermaya himself, Tulsidas. So he's singing this song. So you can see how earnest he is in his appeal. The Lord should just come and remove all these agyana, all, the, all this ignorance ca causing problems like suffering and sorrows from him. And so he can he can move on. This reminds me of here when we say, basically when we say through um, good actions are born they're born in the worlds of the righteous. So there's a reason why you see good people. It's not random. Second point, uh, the next level of rebirth is that they're born into houses of the pure and the prosperous. If they were, we were just to say prosperous, then we'd say, uh oh, you know, that's not also always such a good thing. But pure and prosperous, that's different because they know how to use their wealth. Uh, for good purposes to help others, to help remove the sufferings of others. So that's a good birth. When you have, uh, you're born into parents that uh, have that good means, right livelihood, they call it, in both Vedanta and Buddhism. And then they know how to be generous and help others. That's the next tier. So you see how we're using tears a lot, not T E A R S, T I T I E R S, and levels. So this is how we're explaining this again, Abhumika awakening to other lifetimes. See, basically later on we'll see examines life uh, events in dream. That's the next stage we'll get to next week because we're almost out of time. But this is you can see how if you take these connected, it's not like just you one stage goes away and you don't have it anymore. The next stage goes away and those two are gone. But you're actually taking these up inside of you, so that's that's where uh, um, you were 
having dreams, uh, but and then you kind of thought things are familiar here. I'm having this over and over again, and then a thought might occur to you one lifetime: maybe I have had this again uh, before. Maybe I have lived other lifetimes. But then it becomes very obvious when your dreams start to transform and you're seeing those uh, past lifetimes in a dream and you can't explain from the lifetime that you're living in the waking state how you knew these things in your dream, right? These are subtle insights that happen to you. It's like gifts from mother. You know, the, the old deja vu thing back in the 60s that people got excited about is rather like that. People are beginning to come out of these darker dreams and come into the light. The next level of rebirth, at that level, the soul seeks knowledge and is born in the family of yogis. Um, let's read the quote from the one before it, though. They're born into the houses of the pure and prosperous, Krishna says in the Gita. Having attained the realms of the righteous and living there for countless years, one unable to reach perfection in yoga is born in the homes of the pure and prosperous. So that's what he calls picking up uh, the, the string of your yoga from lifetime to lifetime. Again, doesn't it prove this, you know, if you had these awakenings in the past lifetime, but you didn't take them seriously, and no teacher was there to tell you that you should take these seriously and meditate on them, then in the next lifetime, these things have become a part of your mind's thinking process, and they'll recur. And that's what he's saying here. Uh, or one is then born in a family of wise yogis or rishis. A birth like this is difficult to attain in this world. And why is that? Well, just reread this and you'll know why. <laughs> or look at how dark and dense lifetimes can be and how evil actions are done and how no empathy for suffering, no compassion and so forth. You can burn yourself in a town square if you're a Buddhist and nobody will take note that you're objecting against war. See, You can see this happening uh, even in our own lifetimes, these kinds of things, uh, that we want people to wake up and, and have qualify themselves for better parents, for better births, for the company of the holy, so that non-attachment can grow and desires won't be a problem anymore. Then the next level... Strives for higher knowledge. That means when they're born in the house of yogis, as uh, Sri Ramakrishna said that, there are many hidden householder yogis. Of course, he was in India and he was saying this in the 1800s. There are many hidden householder yogis amongst us and they make the world a much better place. They really add to the society and even though they're not lauded or necessarily, people don't see them for who they really are. How about Nag Mahashaya and his wife in our own tradition? Who? What, what a great pair of uh, Siva Shakti couple that was for us, who they are. Uh, so about this higher knowledge amongst spiritual seekers, he says, in such a birth, the soul retains knowledge of its previous birth and strives harder to attain perfection. We're already jumping up here. You see, to the, uh, the Gyanabhumikas when we read this. So this is why I'm putting this side by side. We'll do a two-minute, three-minute review next week when, when we come back. Uh, maybe show this to where we left off and see how these are leading us to these, out of the Gyanabhumikas to the Gyanabhumikas. Uh, I have one more chart on rebirth to show you, too, that's a very important thing for us to not only just comprehend and understand, but to meditate on in terms of our own lifetimes and where we are today, how far we've come out of the dream and how much darkness is left in us still to be exposed to the light and in others too. But as we finish up here, then the final point here is that purifying the mind through many births finally reaches perfection. And that would be, of course, the Turiya state here. Or back to this chart we were looking at, the the Jivan Mukta state, living liberated. And he says about that, thus striving with assiduity and purified over many births, 
the yogi reaches the goal supreme. So this is a series of successions of higher and higher births that very much corroborate from Lord Krishna's view in the Gita, Lord Vashishtha's teaching uh, much earlier to Ram, the same avatar, Krishna, Ram, and how these teachings are given over and over again to this universal ear of the avatar. When a great teacher speaks those into the ears of an avatar, like whose birthday is tomorrow, Ram Chandra, he's speaking it to the whole seven worlds. Uh, it's just going to be a matter of who's listening, who's listening deeply. So when the avatar begins to mature and come forward, like Jesus did, like Buddha did, like Ramchandra did, like Krishna did, like Sri Ramakrishna did, then you're you're there to hear it. They call that being an Ishvara Koti. You're you're devoted to the manifestation of God in that particular age, fully devoted to them, like we are to Sri Ramakrishna here. And the only thing to say to wrap up the class and this chart, then they live as an adept yogi exemplifying the supreme goal. And Krishna says, that one established in yoga is deemed to be superior to ascetics, to men of knowledge, to those versed in the performance of rituals. Therefore, be thou a yogi, Arjuna, steeped in yoga. Thus established in yoga, even at the hour of death, those higher souls get established and merge with Brahman. Om peace, 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 as we say. So very good. We've run out of time and we've made our way, to, you know, three, maybe into the fourth level of Agyana Bhumika. And you can look back on this in the footfalls of the Rishis. And also this chart is there if you want to compare it across the board in that way. <clears throat> Kripam Kuru Mahadevi Suteshu Pranateshu Cha Charana Shraya Danena Krepamai Namostute Jananim Shadanam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagadurum Padopadmoy Toye Shritwa Pranamami Mahur Pranamami Mahur Mahur. O Ramakrishna, teacher of all, O Sharada, goddess divine, in bosom holding those lotus feet, salutations to both, ever be of mine. <laughs> <laughs>